Hey everyone, I recently played in a five round over the board classical tournament. I scored four out of five and I thought it would be interesting to look at some key positions from this tournament so that you can see what kind of mistakes are deciding games at the club player level. So let's start with this position. Uh, I'm playing black here and black is currently up a pawn. Uh, this was a Sicilian as if you've been following the channel for a while, you know that I'm not a Sicilian player, but I've been trying to learn it because I told myself I was going to learn and play one new opening for white and one new opening for black by the end of the year. Uh, and I did that uh, in this tournament and also in a previous tournament, actually like the weekend before. So <laughs> two tournaments right in a row. Uh, does not always make for very good chess, but we got back into it after this first round loss, which started in this position. I'm up a pawn, right? So I want to trade off queens. But the problem was I didn't look too closely in my head at the resulting position that would come if white were to accept the queen trade. So here I played the move queen a5, and to my opponent's credit, he found this brilliant move and it's the only one to have an advantage for white, which is knight takes b7, and I can't take this knight uh, because then white would take my knight and that comes with check and my king is just very unsafe in that position. So white's probably going to be picking up more pawns or threatening some checkmate ideas in some situations. And so after I traded the queens, white takes with the knight, so now my king is no longer attacking it, and now this resulting position is a big problem for black, and this is what I didn't foresee. I didn't quite look this far in my, you know, mental visualization of what was going to happen, and see that this knight is attacking two pawns. After the knight moves, my knight will be under attack. There's also these threats of coming down here and forking the king and the rook, so it's just not a very pretty situation for black going to be losing some pawns here, and that's exactly what ended up happening. I played rook f7, and um, white ended up winning both of those pawns after these checks, and the game ended pretty quickly afterwards. So let's actually go back to the position where I made the blunder, and I'm going to give you the chance to pause the video and see if you can find a better move here. And these kinds of positions are really good for training because there are multiple good moves here, and it's not a tactic which is going to, you know, hold your advantage or win in this position, which is a lot of times what we end up studying. Studying tactics is good, but 90% of your moves in a chess game are not going to be tactical moves or like sacrificing moves. They're just going to be normal moves that are going to improve your position. So go ahead and pause the video and see if you can find a better option for me than coming up here and trading the queens. Okay, so a few better moves in this position. You could play rook d8, just continuing to hold the pressure. You could play something like rook f4, that also works. Any pawn pushes, g5, h5, all of these are totally fine as well. So basically any move that is not trying to trade queens or any move that doesn't lose you material is pretty good in this position. So for example, like you wouldn't want to play b6 because that's removing the defender of the knight and uh, white would be able to capture it. You also wouldn't want to add another defender to your knight with a rook move like rook c8 because then of course the knight can take. So Anything apart from blunders like that, you're looking pretty nice in this position. You just have to hold the pressure and that's something that clearly I need to work on. So this game was a good lesson. So let's take a look at this next position. Here I have the white pieces and I'm already up a pawn because I won it from a tactic out of the opening. Let's go London system. Uh, but here in this position, we already have a lot of space with our pawns and we're going to be gaining even more space after black's losing move which was capturing this knight on e5. I captured back with the pawn, and now I'm ready to bring my rooks in and try and take control over this open file. And that's exactly what ended up happening in the game. Uh, my opponent ended up being a little more worried about the king's safety over here on the side of the board and the precariousness of those pawns. And so after I brought my rook into d1, queen moves up. I can't bring my rook up here now to trap the queen because, uh-oh, my rook hangs on the back rank. Uh, so I had to move that other rook to c1, and now finally I'm ready to play rook d4, and the queen is totally trapped. So let's go back to that key position and talk about why capturing uh, was kind of the losing move here. Obviously, you know, being down a pawn is also not great for the evaluation, but there were better moves in this position. And let's turn it to Black's perspective. So take a moment to get oriented and see if you can find a better move for Black to play here. So I will say this move admittedly does feel pretty natural because the white knight is so strong and the black bishop seems somewhat weaker just because of the pawn structure. But 
in reality, we could play a move like g5, trying to break open this file. Um, my opponent had already kind of prepared this by moving the rook onto g7 and trying to go after the king. So in these kinds of positions, you don't really want to trade down to an endgame. You would rather keep your attacking pieces on the board and go after some kind of an attack, break open the position. Another move the computer recommends is just rook a8, looking to push a5 and you know come down and take over some of these open files, maybe eventually get a rook into the second rank and start teaming up on this g2 pawn. So in this next game, the mistake was made kind of early in the opening. I think it was just a matter of playing a little bit too fast for my opponent. It's kind of a weird position. It came out of a Polish opening, which was kind of funny. And so the evaluation is actually already kind of in Black's favor, just because the Polish is like not the best opening in the world. Uh, but it, it's not, you know, that significant, especially at this level. But my opponent made it a little bit more significant by castling here in this position. And if you'll see, I can now push this d pawn forward and the bishop is trapped. So I ended up winning a piece quite early in the game. Let's go back and see if we can figure out uh, what my opponent could have done differently in this position. So we'll flip the board on castle and see if you can find a better move in this position for white to play, give you a moment to get orientated, and then you can go ahead and pause the video and figure one out. So pretty much all of the top moves for this position involve just relieving this pawn tension in the center of the board. And that's something um, I'll often tell people as just like a general rule of thumb to do. It's not always the best move, but it gives you more to think about when there is this weird pawn tension happening in the center of the board. It gives you more to calculate on every single move. And so just to make things easier on yourself, if you can play a move like he takes d4, bishop takes d4, knight takes d4, any of these would be better than just leaving that tension there from a practical standpoint, but also the engine tends to agree here just because it's getting a little bit dangerous for white. And this is just a good reminder that it is never too early for things to go wrong. Trust me, I've had these kinds of things happen to me as well. It is quite common at the club player level for people to just rush through the opening because it feels comfortable. Um, you know, they're in a position where they feel they've gotten their opponent out of their comfort zone and you seem to still be in your comfort zone and your opponent just castled, it seems like it's safe for you to castle as well. But when there is this pawn tension, you always have to be calculating every single forced move, which is a capture, a check, or a threat. So let's move on to our fourth game. This was a very interesting and kind of wild game. It started as a London system against a Peart's defense. And we got down to this end game, which is slightly in Black's favor, but generally, like on a practical level, it's pretty equal. Um, and here in this position, my opponent played the losing move, which was rook a8. And the idea, I think, is pretty straightforward. I think he wanted to push a4 and then a3 check, and after my king moves up, looking for a checkmate on b1, but I didn't give him the chance to do it. So here I played queen d4, offering this queen trade, but also threatening these kinds of checks. And if my opponent does trade the queens, just for some visualization, um, my plan is to try and get some passed pawns going. So if my opponent plays here, um, I would move my rook up here so that if they capture, I can capture with the pawn. If they were to instead move their king up, then I could push this pawn. And then ultimately when this rook takes, I'm trying to undouble these pawns in some way and get these connected passers going up the board. That's why it's so much better for white in this position, basically no matter what black does. But my opponent didn't see the checkmating threats and instead captured this pawn. And just a few moves later, I had checkmate on the board. I will say I have gotten this kind of checkmating pattern with these two pieces on the seventh rank or the second rank so many times at the club player level, especially in over the board games. I don't know what it is, if it's just like a pattern that I in particular like to look for, or if it's like a weakness of, you know, club players at a certain level, I'm not quite sure, but I get this all the time. So this is definitely a pattern to be familiar with. Let's go all the way back to that fateful position where black was actually ahead and let's flip the board and see if you can find a better move for black in this position. Go ahead and orientate yourself and pause the video. So there's really only one move for black to hold the advantage here or you know keep kind of a more equal game and that is to just capture the rook on d3. I think it's kind of unnatural because it does allow white to undouble the pawns which in the end game of course you would rather let your opponent keep their doubled pawns but at the very least, it's going to allow for a bunch of checks on the white king. The king is kind of unsafe here, and white's queen is a little less optimally placed to give checks on the black king. 
And so this was probably the better choice for black. Another possible move would be queen c5, just going back exactly where they were and possibly trying to team up on this doubled c pawn, which doesn't have a buddy defending it. All right, so let's go to our final game. And this one is kind of an interesting case because there wasn't really one wrong move, I would say, from black. It was kind of a series of slight inaccuracies that led to a better position for me as white in this end game. So first, let me show you what exactly happened in the game. So in this position, black played probably the first inaccuracy, which was knight f5. This knight's attacking the pawn, so I defended with the king. And now black starts moving their king closer to the action. I moved my knight up, aiming at this square and ultimately aiming at this pawn, which is very difficult for black to protect. The king moves forward again. I played knight a5. And now if the bishop comes back to protect this pawn, it's going to be dropping this pawn. So either way, uh, black's going to be losing a pawn because there aren't any other pieces to hold both of them. So I do end up winning this pawn, black trades off knight for bishop, and these are not always easy endgames to win even when you are up a pawn, but the key is patience, and luckily I had enough of it in this game and managed to convert this winning position. So let's go all the way back to that initial position. Oh, I went a little too far. These rooks get traded off, and black played knight f5. Let's flip the board, go back a move, go ahead and orientate yourself, and see if you can find a slightly more accurate move for black to play. Once again, these are not tactical kind of positions. They're very like slow and maneuvering types of things, which for some reason I tend to get myself into in longer chess games, but they're still good to practice if you're looking to get better at chess because a lot of your games are going to end up like this. So go ahead and pause the video and see if you can figure out a slightly better move. Okay, this game was so interesting because the margin of error was like so slim. Like it, it was really unclear, I think, where exactly the game slipped away from my opponent. So I think to put into words as much as possible, the key to this game was really all about patience, which going up a pawn, that ultimately ended up winning me the game, but I still had to be patient. And here, black could have been a little bit more patient by not necessarily, you know, just right away going for trades, assuming that the end game was drawn, um, because of the pawn structure or something, but having just a little bit more patience and understanding the nuances of the position and also understanding what exactly white wants in this position. We saw in the way that the game goes that I wanted to come here, here, and boop, grab this pawn, right? So a good way to prevent this is to simply put a piece somewhere to stop that knight from coming in and grabbing that pawn. So a good move here would be knight c6, because ultimately, once this knight were to come up here, you would just make an equal trade if that's you know what white wants to do. I probably wouldn't have done that because that doubles my pawns on the side of the board, but you get the point. It kind of discourages that kind of a plan for white and makes white also have to think a little bit harder about what the plan's going to be. Computers also suggesting moves like g5, just like you know starting this pawn storm over here and I assume trying to get the king out and a little bit more involved in the center of the board um, or something just like king f8, just moving towards the center again in these kind of endgames, it is important to get your king involved as soon as possible and, you know, move up towards the center. But nuance is important. And like I said, it's important to see what your opponent wants to do and prevent that as the first order of business. That's all I've got. I hope you enjoyed learning from these games as much as I enjoyed playing them. If you want to see the games in their entirety, I have them over on my other channel, my VOD channel. I did live stream all of those games. So if you want to catch future tournaments like this, you can go ahead and follow me on Twitch as well. That's where they will be. Um, in this case, two of the games had commentary. The others were just kind of chill and you, you know, you can see the board and the camera and everything. And you can just kind of see what an over the board tournament is like, which I just think is really interesting. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you soon.